Now, after Trump was elected, a lot of people decided to run for office or join campaigns. You decided to start a podcast that grew into a media company. Mm -hmm. Why did you take that path? Oof. Uh, I, well, we thought that the media didn't perform perfectly in the 2016 election. So part of it was trying to uh, do our part to correct that error. But there was also a piece of this where if you watched the news in 2016 and you were upset by what you saw, there was no way to figure out what you personally could do to get involved to fix it. So we wanted to have news and analysis infused with activism and just sort of create something that didn't exist anywhere else. Now, did you envision the success that would come from that and the path to HBO specials now? Yes. No. <laughs> no, do the real answer. Do the no answer. We did not at all. <laughs> we didn't. Um, but look, I, you know, people have said to us since we started, it's just a lot of people, uh, people who participated in politics before and people, a lot of people who hadn't uh, said, Trump was elected president. I didn't know what to do. I knew I wanted to do something. And so I needed some place to go to figure out what to do about all this bad news. And we, our hope was to provide a home for that. Now, how do you differenti differentiate between the twice a week podcasts and what you show in the HBO specials? Look, there's a lot of news every week. So, you know, we're kind of having the same conversation, but it's a live show. So we do some games, we break down some news clips, uh, we have bigger guests. But it's basically a version of the live show we've been doing across the country for the past year and a half. Yeah. Now, you kind of alluded to this already. Mm -hmm. How often are you drawing on your experience in the Obama White House when you're strategizing about how you break through the noise of this, like, the Trump era news cycle it's impossible to keep up with? Um, I think, anyone want to take that? I mean, I think the one thing that the president taught us through his communication style is to um, to be honest, to tell hard truths, to um, be comfortable in your own skin. But what about Obama? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we get that's what Trump taught you, but what about Obama? <laughs> <laughs> well, both, yeah, both presidents in a way. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I think that you have to, like, there's politics today, especially, and this is true of Democratic politics and Republican politics, there's too much spin, there are too many sound bites, there's too many people trying to, you know, um, Pull, pull one over on you. And I think to be honest and have difficult conversations about where politics is and where it needs to go is, you know, people want that now because they have very finely tuned BS detectors. Well, you've talked about how engaged your audience is. Mm -hmm. Do you think that kind of happened because the podcast is a more intimate format or it's just a combination of that and the moment that we're in right now? I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think Podcasts do feel intimate. It's something you're doing kind of on your own. You know, I, like I listen to a lot of podcasts and it does feel like you're sitting at the table with people. But also, this is we've been in a campaign pace, like a fevered pitch paying attention to politics for the past two years, ever since Trump won. It's a natural response to what is an emergency. And one of the upsides of that is I think people have kind of knitted themselves together a little bit. And we're all paying attention more, or a lot of people are paying attention more. A lot of people have understood in a way maybe they didn't before, maybe they should have, that politics does affect them personally. Yeah. They feel disenfranchised. They feel like the system isn't respecting them, listening to them. And uh, that's led people to want to get involved in a way they haven't before. And I think the test in these midterm elections is, can that enthusiasm, can that energy outweigh the decades of mistrust and fury and vitriol in a sense that politics doesn't matter? You know, What's going to win out? And it, it's a hard slog. We really don't know. But what's exciting is to see that people are starting to pay attention. Now, you started in January 2017, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the midterms are the first kind of like big engagement test of Ugh. your audience and where we stand. <laughs> I mean, I think that what's been cool is that the people who listen to the show, there's a little community that's built up around it. Yeah. So every single weekend, like dozens of people are tweeting at us, hey, I canvassed for the first time today for X or Y candidate, yeah. went out for Stacey Abrams today, knocked on some doors. Like, I saw Mitch McConnell at a restaurant. I yelled at it for two hours. <laughs> you know, people no. were trying to win the house. <laughs> so, so I think like for us, that, that is the test. Like, <laughs> I don't think we have the ability to tip the election one way or the other. I do think we tried our damnedest to get people to register to vote, know that their vote matters, get engaged, and get involved. Yeah. Now, you all seem pretty close. How much of the success of the podcast and now the shows do you think is because of your relationships with each other? This is a, a role we're playing. <laughs> it's all acting, right? I think, I think I a lot it. of it is. I think having chemistry is really important. And I think, um, you know, even when you, we now have like 10 podcasts at Crooked Media, yeah. and we're friendly with a lot of the hosts, and some of the hosts come on our podcast too, and there is like having that sort of chemistry and relationship really helps yeah. as, uh, as you're talking about politics all the time. Now, launching 10 in like a year, a year and a half, that's impressive. Are you, do you think you'll, you'll be at 20 by like next year or what? 
Oof. I know. We haven't even thought about that, really. <laughs> Just I focusing think, on HBO? Look, one of the things that's been helpful is have, we didn't really have a plan when we set out to do this. I think we were guided by like two things. One, we were really frustrated uh, by the state of the political conversation, not journalism, but, but the way people talk about politics, punditry. And two, uh, we believe that something was broken in our politics and we want to get involved in and, and tell people why we care about it and why we want to fix it. And what's been exciting is to see that there are a lot of people who felt the same way we did. And everything we do in launching new shows is making sure that it engages people uh, to be involved and in in entertains people um, and informs people. Right? And as long as we're trying to do those three things, we're always looking for ways to find new audiences and new, new people to reach that way. I wanted to ask you about pundits. Obviously, you guys all rail a lot against some of the um, mistakes of TV punditry or, or the flaws in it. So we became them. <laughs> well, that, that's my point. Would you, do you think of each other as pundits now? Like, how do you view yourselves? Or you're, you're like determined to always be different. I think of myself as a dreamer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll always think of us as you know activists, as people who are in politics. Even though we definitely <laughs> act like pundits a lot. But look, I think our problem with punditry was there's too much focus on what might happen, not enough focus on what should happen. And look, for a lot of pundits, that's not their role to talk about what should happen. Yeah. Um, we're activists at heart. We came from democratic politics. We worked for Barack Obama. And so we believe much more in talking to people about what should happen in politics. And so we try to focus on that a lot more. Yeah. How often do you think Obama listens to your podcast? Uh, twice a week. He emails every time. And with Feedback notes. for every yeah, episode. That's good. Too. Last time I saw him a couple of months ago, he's like, I can't believe people are still listening to your podcast. <laughs> He's like, that's so weird. <laughs> it's like, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, boss. That's cool. great. <laughs> that's great. OK, so taking the idea of doing, talking about the news differently, the migrant caravan story, I've yeah. seen you're also like actively tweeting about <clears throat> this and, and how cable news should or shouldn't cover it. We're trying to think thoughtfully at now this. What, what's our approach? How do we debunk the lies that President Trump is telling about it, but also without amplifying those lies? Yeah. Yep. So what's your advice? I mean. I for me, if you're going to cover this issue at all, I think the story is the lie and why he's lying about this. He's trying to scare a bunch of older white voters who are his base that a bunch of brown people are coming who apparently now include ISIS members. They're going to take their jobs, vote, and do God knows what else. And organized so, by Democrats. Organized by George Soros. Right. So I think explaining why he's doing what he's doing is, is important. I do think, though, like when you turn on cable news, and you see images of this group of individuals that makes it look like there is, in fact, an army of people, as the AP described them, coming towards the border. If you don't contextualize that with the fact these are women and children, people fleeing a desperate situation, yeah. they're 1,100 miles away from our border right now. There's no urgency to this issue. It is a manufactured political issue created by a craven human being who uses race and fear to win elections. Yeah, it's like, that, to me, is the story. That's to me, the most damning commentary on this whole thing came from a former Trump advisor in the Washington Post today and said, uh, we love it. I wish they were bringing heroin so it was even scarier. Wow. So it's just it ex exposing the game for what it is, yeah. I think, is important. So it's not just that it's a lie, but as Tommy was saying, it's the motivation behind the lie. Who that's the really important. That? Uh, like Bennett, one of their, some former Trump advisor in the oh, Post. He goes, I wish we thought I of the whole thing. I wish they were bringing heroin. <laughs> So we're, we're, we're talking about errors that media, including yeah. the AP, is still making. When you look at 2018 coverage versus, versus what we saw in 2016, do you think we've improved at all? <laughs> I, I would have said yes, but I have to say this caravan coverage is making a lot of the same mistakes again. Because it's, it's, it's not just about covering the lie. It's also about putting it in, in the context of, like, the nightly news, ABC, NBC, CBS, they led with the caravan last night. That's not just about debunking a lie. That's elevating a story and making people think it's the most important thing. Now, right. what this election is actually about right, is what the Congress will do in the next two years. And we know what that is. It's about whether they will pass another tax cut, whether they will cut Medicare and Social Security, whether they will have another shot at repealing Obamacare, whether they will actually hold hearings about Donald Trump. Right? Those are the incredibly high stakes issues that are actually on the table in this election. And they get absolutely no coverage. Even if a nightly news broadcast takes Donald Trump's caravan story and then debunks it, they are still elevating it and leading the news with it and showing people that this is, the, this is, this is at the core of what this election is about when it isn't. And even, you know, and Donald Trump is being so explicit about generating this story. And the fact that it's working is very, very sad. And it is, I think right now, maybe the equivalent of what the email story was mm -hmm. in 2016, where even as it was debunked, even as it was discussed as to whether or not it should matter, it led in newspapers, it led in news broadcast, and it became so salient for people that it was what they were thinking about when they were voting. Right. 
Yeah, I also want to be like clear. I mean, I think the news, the journalists have done an amazing job since Trump's election. We've seen like Pulitzer-worthy coverage yeah. of the Russia investigation policy, like all like amazing, especially print journalism. Yeah. I think where we sometimes still get into problems is cable TV choices made uh, by TV news producers like that, and and the punditry. Yeah. Where you know you turn it on and there's eight heads in eight different boxes, sort of offering you both sides of an issue when. In fact, it's pretty clear. Right. Now, don't forget video on demand outlets like now this. They're perfect. They <laughs> All they do is. Work. It's on camera saying that's no, perfect. So, Crooked Media was formed pretty quickly after the election of Trump. Do you guys have a strategy for if the midterms don't turn into a blue wave? Wake up, get back to work. I mean, that's the strategy. If we win, you wake up and get back to work. If we lose, you wake up and get back to work because it's our only option. This election is incredibly important. It is incredibly important for people's health care. It's incredibly important for whether or not we send a message to Donald Trump that we don't accept his corruption and his chaos. But what the actual vote is, is not a sure thing, certainly. But more than that, it's, it's a test. How much harder is this going to be? Uh, how much does the activism energy that we have seen uh, make a difference versus the propaganda apparatus, the anti-voting apparatus, uh, the um, the fundamental cultural mistrust and sense that politics doesn't matter, right? We are, we have been in a state of kind of political attention for two years, uh, but we're dealing with decades old problems and maybe there'll be enough votes of people out there to send a message and win the house, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, whether we win the house by a point or lose by house by a point, the, 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 the job we have doesn't change the day after the election. Yeah, if the activism wasn't enough, that means we have to work even harder the next time. Right. If it was enough, that means we still have to work really hard, right. <laughs> even though we get to know that we're on the right track. Right, right. So with the 10 podcasts and now HBO shows, what do you see as sort of the unifying theme or voice um, among Crooked Media? I don't know that there is one. I mean, when we wanted to create a bunch of new shows, we, we wanted to talk to people who are different than us you know, people of color, women, like we want to create shows that didn't represent our views and have a diversity of opinion and a more, you know, vigorous debate. So I think that's more important to us than any sort of unifying editorial voice. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's a, you know, we call it a, a no, conver no, sorry, we call it a no bullshit conversation about politics. Yeah. And we look for content that informs, entertains, and inspires action. And a lot of that is centered around politics, but we also have podcasts that talk about culture, that talk about activism, yeah. uh, that talk about all kinds of other things. But it usually touches the national conversation in some way. Um, and you know, we hope that it's a conversation that people can relate to because, um, like we say, it's no bullshit. How do you yourself unplug and cope with everything that's happening? Do you? I do not. You don't. <laughs> he, he genuinely does it, and it's, it's frankly frightening. Um, crossword puzzles, all right? You got to crush them. All right, Monday, Tuesday, that's easy. Wednesday, it's getting tricky. Thursday, that's hard. And I don't know about these Friday, Saturday people. I don't know no about idea. them. Sunday. You got a crossword puzzles? When was the last time you did a crossword puzzle? Oh, you want so Friday, Saturday is the hardest? Friday and Saturday, I don't know. Sunday is just big. Yeah, Sunday's big. Video games. Okay. Video games good. Red Dead Redemption 2. Red Dead Redemption 2 is coming out soon, all right? Are they a sponsor? Yes. Would I have said <laughs> this anyway? Absolutely. <laughs> Books. I'm just kidding. Let's <laughs> <laughs> not get crazy. Yeah, yeah. Right. One on one. Well, I'm not getting in a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me let me end on a quick word association game. Jared Kushner. <laughs> uh, milk toast Machiavelli is my favorite description of Jared Kushner. That's, that's a great one. Legacy admission everywhere, <laughs> including White House. Uh, jail. <laughs> Ooh, good one. Leads kind of into the next one. Also a legacy. Yes, Robert Mueller. Hurry up. Ah, that was going to be mine. <laughs> <laughs> I really was going to say the same thing. Comey, but good. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have another one? Uh, no, I'll just, I'm, that's the only one I can think of. Okay. Uh, Donald Trump Jr. Douchebag. Bad rap. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> large adult man. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, the large adult son. Can I call him a douchebag? I think I probably have. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, he's a fucking douchebag. And then midterms. Hmm. And there's not one word. Anxiety. <laughs> anxiety <laughs> that was a lot word. of anxiety. I there just saw is. there that yeah. happened. Anxiety is mine. Yeah. yeah. Vote. <laughs> please, please vote. Yeah. Everyone vote. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Please vote. Great. Votesaveamerica.com. Awesome.
Yeah. Nice. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Thank this you. was Thank really you. a lot of fun. Yeah.